Our next topic is the false discovery rate. This is similar to the family-wise error rate. This is a, a sort of quantity that you know, statisticians have worked out how to design testing procedures so that we have a guarantee that we can control this quantity um, at, at a reasonable level. And so the big difference between the false discovery rate and the family-wise error rate is the false discovery rate is really not as strict. The family-wise error rate, what it tries to control is the chance of making any mistakes. And the false discovery rate, roughly speaking, tries to control the proportion of mistakes among the rejected that, are, that, are, that we make. So if we, make, if we reject 100 um, hypotheses, uh, you know, we can expect, if we control the false discovery rate around 20%, that about 20 of those 100 are likely to be truly null, that, that we didn't actually make a discovery. But on the other hand, we would have made maybe 80 out of 100 true discoveries. In many, in many situations, this is much more useful. You think of a biologist who's looking to find genes that are responsible for a type of cancer. Um, if you declare there's 25 genes responsible based on testing, and you say the false discovery rate is, is, is 5%, then you know you have, a good I you have some idea of, of those 25 genes that you've discovered, how many are likely to be false discoveries, mm -hmm. but the bulk of them will be good discoveries. That's, more, that's a more meaningful um, way of controlling the error rate when you do multiple testing. Yes, yeah. So there are some, some places where family-wise error rate might be, like in, in a clinical trial, for instance, if you don't want to have any really adverse reactions, that might be better. Rather than having some proportion of adverse reactions, you might want to have very few. So there, there are, their applications vary. But false discovery rate is certainly a very, very popular and, and meaningful in many contexts. So we're, we're instead of genes, like Trevor's example here, we're going we're, we're gonna to apply the false discovery rate to, to our fund manager. So we have 2,000 fund managers. Earlier, we looked at five of them. And we're going to try and uh, choose a, a threshold for the p-values that um, to control the, 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 um, the false discovery rate. And the big difference in terms of implementation, we're going to use the same function to compute adjusted p-values it's using, instead of Holm and Bonferroni, we give this FDR B8 as the argument. So FDR stands for false discovery rate. B8 is, stands for Benjamini Hochberg, which is the, the procedure that's used to control the family's discovery rate. OK, and uh, so when we look at the, these things are called, um, often called Q values rather than P values. Uh, so when we look at now the first 10 uh, Q values, we actually see our really strong performing manager actually no longer is under 5%. On the other hand, um, well, it's not necessarily clear that 5% is the right threshold. Often for FDR, people will choose a threshold like 20% instead of, instead of 5%. So at a 20% FDR cutoff manager, the first manager looks pretty well. So maybe you will still want his phone number later, Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so let's take a look, comparing these two methods. So suppose we control false discovery at 10%. How many of our managers are, you know, out of the 2,000, seem to be beating uh, the, the market at a level of 10%? Well, it seems um, there are 146 of them that beat the market, that according to this threshold of 10% are beating the market. So we'd expect out of these 150, you know, roughly 15 or so would be um, you know, might be ones who all can't really beat the market um, and are maybe guessing randomly or something like that. Let's compare that to Bonferroni. So the, the simple way to implement the Bonferroni procedure is just to take the raw p-values and um, we either multiply them and compare it to 10% or take the 10% and divide it by the number of p-values. So 0 0.01 divided by 2,000. And we see here actually no one seems to be outperforming the market. Um, uh, that way. So if these were genes and there were actually some really important genes, well, we would have made more discoveries um, for potential future research if we controlled fa false discovery rate than family-wise error rate. So there's a plot that goes along with the benjamin Hawk pr procedure that, that's quite popular. And we're just going to take a, a look at it below. So there's a, there's a, a particular rule um, for uh, Benjamin Hochberg, and I'll just write it quickly here. It compares the the j smallest p value, that's p underscore j, to um, 
the quantity uh, alpha, if that's say 10%, 0 0.1 times J over M. So it compares these two things. P, you know, it asks whether the Jth P value is smaller than that threshold or not. And that that's what this line here uh, represents. And the way the, uh, the procedure is done is uh, it finds the, um, let's see, the, the largest j, that is the most liberal threshold, the last time that pj is less than or equal to alpha j over m. And that's, you can see here, these are the p values, and this is the last time this curve is below this dashed line. So this marks the Benjaminia Hochberg threshold, and it rejects everything to the left. And you see it actually included some of these p values that, to start off, didn't seem to get under that line. Um, so if we, if we stopped the first time the p-value was not less than that, we would have stopped here, and that would be, you know, that would be nothing. Um, so this is a sort of visual description of the Benjamin-Hockberg procedure.